redemption means to, to, to set free by the paying of a price. And there's really kind of three concepts involved. One is you go into the slave market and you identify the slave and you pay the price for him. Then you take the, the, the slave out of the slave market because he's no longer going to be a slave. He's removed out of the slave market, so he's no longer in, he, he's no longer on the sale block. He's no longer in change. You, you set him free. You have brought him out of the slave market. Now he's free. We just sang the song, Glorious Freedom. I love that song because it goes through all those different things. Freedom from folly, freedom from fear, freedom from evil temper and anger and all those things. You know, you can say freedom from folly, freedom from fear, freedom from this, and freedom from beer and all that stuff. But, boy, when you get down to the evil temper and anger, you know, whoo, boy, you've got, you, you kind of get under everybody's skin there, don't you? And, but that's what, that's what the grace of God does. It reaches right down into who you are, and it changes you. So you're set free from sin. But then it doesn't just, take, it doesn't just pay the price and, and, and doesn't get you out of the slave market. Then it says, okay, now you're free. You're not out. You're, 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 you're completely at liberty. And the issue here about the redemption of the purchased possession, the price is paid. But there's an aspect of redemption where you're going to be not just have the price paid and not just be brought out, but you're going to be taken into a whole new life. The prospect of redemption is that God one day is going to come and there's going to be the redemption of the purchased possession. Now that is the, 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 the sequence in, these, in this verse is extremely important because he says, in whom, you, in whom you also trusted. The first issue in salvation is trusting Christ alone. When do you trust Christ? After that you heard the word of the truth, the gospel of your salvation. No one ever gets saved except by believing the gospel. You don't get saved by believing there's a creator. You don't get saved by believing that Jesus is a good guy. You don't get saved by believing all kinds of theological doctrines about Christianity. You get saved by trusting the Lord Jesus Christ, and you do that when you hear the word of the truth of the gospel. The gospel is how that Jesus Christ died for our sins, was buried, and was raised again for our justification. And salvation... Romans 1.16, Paul says, For the gospel of Christ is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. It's, the, it's not the issue of just knowing Jesus died on the cross, or even accepting the fact that he did and believing that he died on the cross. It's not just that believing that he was buried and that he rose again, knowing it, believing it, and accepting it. It's believing that that is an adequate payment for your acceptance before God. And it's relying exclusively on that. Not that and something that you do, but just on that. And that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, uh, that's what we call justification by faith alone. I was in a meeting one time a couple of years ago, and after the morning meeting, we, we went with a group of us to a restaurant to eat lunch. And after we, we were, while we were eating... There's another group of people came in and sat at a big table next to us, maybe uh, uh, also a large group of people, who had come from church. And they were just talking about church this morning and talking about this and having a good time. So when we got up to leave and, and, and to, to exit the restaurant, another brother and I walked over just to say hi to them and he, uh, asked, is there anybody at this table that knows where they're going to go when they die? And, oh, yes, yeah, absolutely, we're all going to heaven. How do you know? Well, we, you know, we, we, we. And so I, I asked her, tell me, could you tell me how you can know for sure? I mean, you, you know, how do you know for sure that you're going to go to heaven when you die? And a lady, she spoke up, she says, well, you believe in Jesus. I said, okay, and what else? And she looked at me and she said, well, then you've got to live a good life. Yeah, see, that's too much. <laughs> what she should have said, nothing. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> and see, that's the difference between believing in Jesus and something else and believing in Christ, trusting him alone. Nothing else, exclusively. Now, when you trust him exclusively, and that's what the gospel tells you. The gospel tells you the problem is you're a sinner, you're separated from God, the price is the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the gospel tells you nothing else will do. 
So when you trust him, in whom you trusted, after that you heard the word of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, after you hear the gospel, you know there's only one thing that you can do to have eternal life, a home in heaven, your sins forgiven, and that's to trust what God did for you, because you can't do it yourself. So where salvation starts in the verse is trusting Christ alone. Then he says, after that, when you trust Christ, God does something. In response to your faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ, God does it. After that, you believed. When you trusted Christ, in response to that, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Now that's interesting. You're sealed. When you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, then God the Holy Spirit, in response to your faith, in Christ alone, He seals you. Now, there's, there, there actually, you know, we talk about the cribs. There are five specific things at that, that instant the Holy Spirit does. C-R-I-B-S. He circumcises you with a circumcision of the flesh made not, not made with hands. Uh, that's, that, that's where you're crucified with Christ. Then he regenerates you, implants God's life in you, quickens you by his spirit. He comes to indwell you to be the resident member of the Godhead inside of your body, and your body becomes the temple of the Holy Ghost. That's an awesome thought, thought you know that? Everywhere you go, everything you do, you carry around God the Holy Spirit with you. If you were to live in the consciousness of that reality, it would probably change some of the places you go. It would probably change some of the things you put in your body. I wouldn't have to tell you to do this or do that. You could, be, you could, as a mature person, look at that and say, well, would the Lord like to go here? Would the Lord like to be looking at this? Would the Lord like to be doing this? Is this the attitude of the Lord? I mean, he's in you. That's a, that's a, that's a terribly, uh, 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 I almost said terrifying. <laughs> that's a terribly comforting thought, a wonderfully comforting thought. I guess get the adjectives right there. A wonderfully comforting thought, but also an arresting thought. Then he baptizes you. That is, that's how you get into Christ. He literally takes you out of the old identity that you had in Adam and puts you into his son. So there he's crucified you with his son. You're dead with Christ. He's regenerated you. He's made you alive with Christ. He's come to dwell within you, and he's put you in an identity where you are accepted in the beloved. And then he seals you. He literally puts you in an encapsulized, inside of an encapsulized environment of God the Holy Spirit. And that sealing is until he's, he, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Now, the promise is that one day he's purchased you. You're waiting for him to come pick you up. And the promise is, I'm going to come and pick you up. You've done that. You've gone down to Sears or J.C. Penney's or Montgomery. Well, they're gone now, aren't they? Uh, <laughs> show my age uh, <laughs> and my shopping ability. And you, you go somewhere, and you buy something, and they say, well, now you've got to go around to the loading dock and pick it up. And you go around to get it, and you've got the receipts paid for. It's yours. And you're just standing there waiting to pick it up. We went over to, when we moved recently, my wife decided we needed a, a new bed, a new mattress. And so we, we go over here to the discount mattress place, and we go in, and we found a mattress. And they said, okay, this is your mattress. Now go over there and pay for it. So we went over here and paid for it. I came back over. The mattress is gone. The man says, oh, it's around at the loading dock. So we go around the building, go into, into the back, and knock on the door. Nobody comes. So we ring the doorbell. Nobody comes. Finally, somebody came. Somebody's going in. And I said, I'm going to go in with you because they got something in there that belongs to me. And he says, you know. So I get in. And you know what? There sat my mattress on a dolly, waiting for me to pick it up. <laughs> and you know what I did? I took it out, put it in the truck, took it home. Now, that's the redemption of the purchased possession. You're sealed. You're secure. It's mine. And I'm just waiting for him to come. And the promise of the Spirit is, I'm going to come get you. You don't have to worry about it. If you look over at chapter 4, verse 30. The comparative verse. Grieve not the Holy, God, Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed, notice, until, unto the day of redemption. Now that seal is an important thing. 
In the Bible, a seal talks about several things. It talks about um, ownership. The seal is, an, is a mark of its mind. Look at 2 Timothy chapter number 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19. Paul says, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. Here's the, here's the mark on it. The Lord knoweth them that are his. So when he seals you with the Holy Spirit, he puts a stamp on you and it says, Mine. And I know those that belong to me because I've marked them out and they are mine. Yo, you wonder who they belong to? I got my name on them. You know, we have meals around here every now and then. Isn't it amazing how Christian people can't get along without eating and eating? So, I mean, we all eat, but I mean eating together. And you, people bring in food, bring a bowl. And if you want the bowl back, what did you better do? Put your name on it. You identify it. Well, the seal, God the Holy Spirit, and you notice Ephesians 1.13, it says you're sealed with the Holy Spirit. It's not so much that you're sealed by the Holy Spirit, that's true, but you're sealed with him. Hold your hand there come in Ephesians and come back to 2 Corinthians chapter number 1 because the process here is important. Ephesians 1 verse... 21, 2 Corinthians 1, verse 21, 2 Corinthians 1, 21. Now he which establisheth us with you in Christ and hath anointed us is God. That's the Father. It's God the Father that has established you, has established you with us in Christ. It's the Father, it's the directive of God the Father that you be in Christ. So when the Holy Spirit circumcises and crucifies you, when he regenerates you, when he indwells you, when he baptizes you, when he seals you, he's doing it at the direction of the Father. It's the Father's will that you be sealed. That's a wonderful thing. Who also hath sealed us and given us the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. So it's God the Father who directs God the Holy Spirit to seal you and to be your earnest when you trust Christ. All the Trinity is working in your behalf. God's for you. Every member of the Godhead's working on your behalf. Nobody's against he, God's always for you, never against you. One member of the Godhead didn't say, well, I will. The other one didn't say, I won't. They're all saying, let's do it. In fact, they're already said, it's done. <laughs> so you're sealed by God the Father. He's the one who directs you to do it, directs him to do it. But Ephesians 1 says, talks about a little bit, it's a different preposition. You're sealed with the Holy, Holy Spirit. To be sealed with it. My wife, we were just down in Ridge Farm, and one of the things that, you know, back in the 80s when I first started going down there and having conferences, the first time I ever went, I thought, boy, I can, I should, I can never bring my wife down here. We hadn't, we hadn't lived here very long, and she was still kind of homesick for Alabama. She still is. I don't know why. But uh, it's, it's, it's home, the old life, you know. And, and, uh, but, boy, you go down there, they even talk like people from Alabama. They have a little accent, and it's, it's, it's country, and it's rural. And I said, boy, if I ever bring her down here, I'll never get her home. So I had to take her. A couple of years later, I took her, and sure enough, it took, I'd take her down, we'd spend the weekend, take her, it'd take her three weeks to get used to coming, get, get over being down there, you know. So I, I thought, boy, this is, uh, that's, that's a one. One of the things she loves down there is that they, uh, they, they do a lot of gardening. And we go down there like in the fall now, and uh, Ms. Chestnut, Lois, Lois will, she, we, we brought a big cooler back of corn and green beans and all that stuff, you know, how, how you do all that stuff in the garden. And my wife used to love to can. When we lived in Alabama, we lived on a farm, and we had a big, we had a blackberry patch about the size of this room. Then we had peach trees, two peach trees. Then we had uh, a garden, and she would, she would just go nuts. Can I got a picture of my wife when she, when she's about 23 years old, standing in that briar patch with a pair of uh, 
uh, uh, fireman boots up past her knees. You wear those big rubber boots because if you stepped on a snake, it, 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 you know, rattlesnakes are bad down there, and they get in the briar patch to catch the little animals, and you're walking around. You can't see them. You step on one, he bites you. But if, if it's, you got on those rubber boots, you, they, and they, got, they come back and go, need to go to the dentist. <laughs> so it's protection. So she, you know, she's got her buckets, you know. And then she'd bring that, that stuff in, she'd cook it, and then she'd put it in this water bath on the stove. And I can remember sitting in the living room, listening to that water bath, and it would go, like that. And when you hear that, you hear a good one, you say, I got a good seal on that thing. Because you cook it in that water bath and, and, until that seal sets. And when it does, you'd hear that little pop. And if you didn't hear that little pop, you know that one didn't work. Got to do it. Got to do it again. My the 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 preserves were sealed by my wife, but they were sealed with that little rubber gasket. Okay, you're sealed by God the Father, but it's with the Holy Spirit. He literally puts you into an encapsulized environment of God, the Holy Ghost. That's why you don't need angels to come and minister to you. That's why you don't need all this stuff out yonder. Listen, you've got the third member of the Godhead on duty as your seal, as your security, giving you your identity, demonstrating that you belong to Him, a seal. Starts out with the idea of, it's mine. I own them. Why? There's my seal on them. It also has to do with security. You're sealed until the day of redemption. Look back at Daniel chapter 7. I'm sorry, Daniel chapter 6. When, when Daniel got put into the lion's den, you remember that. Very significantly, Daniel chapter 6 verse 17 when they put him in the lion's den, and a stone was brought and laid upon the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lords. Why? That the purpose might not be changed. He put him in, put the seal on it. Why? To secure it. So there wasn't going to be any change. There wasn't going to be any deviation. The purpose was going to be accomplished, and there was security in it. Let me show you another one. I like this one even better. Revelation chapter 20. Oh, Darius back then, Daniel chapter 6, he didn't, want, he didn't want Daniel in the lion's den. He got hoodwinked into doing that. But when he put that seal on it, he couldn't take him out. He's secure. Revelation chapter 20. And I saw an angel come down from heaven having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the, de the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, binds this guy, chains him up, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and watch, and set a seal upon him. Why? That he should, be de not, that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he may be, might be, must be loosed a little season. He puts Satan in the bottomless pit, you think Satan would want to get out of there? You think he would try to get out of there? So he seals that. So he can't get out. You see, that seal is a, is a, is a it's for security. When he puts you into Christ and seals you with God the Holy Spirit, you literally have the protection of the third member of the Godhead taking care of your inner man, your spirit, your soul, and you're secure. You're secure until the day of redemption. Now, by the way, you're there in Revelation. Look back at Revelation chapter 7 because you, you learn something else about a seal. Revelation chapter 7, And after these things I saw four angels standing on the, on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, and the wind, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor the sea, nor, the, nor any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. 
And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels uh, to, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and, and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the, the trees, till I have sealed the servants of our God in their forehead. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and he begins to give you the identification. There the seal is used not simply for security, but it's used for identification. You've got that seal on them so the, the, the angels knew which people not to mess with. So a seal demonstrates ownership. It demonstrates security. It demonstrates the identity of the person involved. So when he says back over in Ephesians 1 that, that you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, you've got security, you've got your identity, you've got the fact that you belong to him all wrapped up in what God's done for you in Christ. When you trust the gospel, when you trust Christ, listen, the Godhead moves in your behalf. And you have these wonderful things. You can never understand the Bible without having God the Holy Spirit as your teacher. The question then is how do you get the Holy Spirit as your teacher? People say, I'm going to go over here in the corner and I'm going to pray. Oh, God, fill me. Hit me. Give me your spirit. Somebody says, I'm going to go over here and do this and that and the next thing. And God, will That verse tells you how to have the Holy Spirit. You want to understand God's Word? You want to understand the Christian life? You want to understand what it is to know these things? The first thing you need to do is get saved. The greatest impediment that people have, the first great impediment, is people are lost. And lost people never understand God. What you need to understand is the gospel, that you're lost, you're a sinner, you're separated from God, God paid the price, provided the redemption, gives it to you as a free gift, and when you trust Him, then He gives you everything else. And one of the things He gives you is God the Holy Ghost. Now, the way the Holy Spirit works in your life is the same way. It's through His Word working in you. He wrote the Word. Jesus said, the Word that I speak unto you, they are, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. And the way God the Holy Spirit will work in your life is when you believe His Word, then He becomes the energizing bunny in your life. Strengthens you in your inner man. Sealed with the Holy Spirit. Of promise. Now, the promise is verse 14 which is the earnest of our inheritance. That's the prospect. Folks, you got an inherit. You got something coming. The earnest of our inheritance until the day, until the redemption of the purchased possession. Until the time he takes what he paid for and what he has set free, comes, pick it up, take it home with him. Now that's sealing until the day of redemption. An earnest, you know what an earnest is. That's, that's, you go buy a piece of real estate, you put some earnest money down. That's a down payment. It's a, it's a foretaste of what's to come. It's a promise that I'll finish the transaction. So I give you a piece of what's coming. I'm going to buy a piece of real estate. It's going to be 100000 bucks. I don't know where you could buy something around here like that, but you know, we'll just use that as a round number. And I'll say, I'll give you an earnest money. I'll give you $10,000 because I'm, going to, I'm promising you, and I'll guarantee that I'm going to do this because I'll give you this as a down payment, as earnest. This is a part of that. If I'm going to pay you $10,000, I can't give you uh, 10,000 pesos. I can't give you 10,000 pieces of corn. See, what I give you has got to be what that is. It's, got to be, it's a foretaste of that. If I say I'm going to pay you 100000 Ears of corn, then I can't bring you beets <laughs> or rocks. Whatever the payment's going to be, the earnest has got to be a foretaste of that. So what you have is God the Holy Spirit indwelling you, identifies you in Christ, puts you in Christ, does all, seals you there, and that's the earnest, that's the foretaste of what you're going to have in the future. That's why when we were talking about adoption, I kept saying to you, that verse in Romans 6, verse 13 is always thrilling to me. Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead. You can live in the reality of being already alive from the dead, already experiencing the resurrection life, 
That's the life you have now. You don't wait to get eternal life when you, to when you die. You got it when you trusted Christ. But your redemption isn't finished because you still got the old man hanging on you. But he had to leave you in that old man, that old, that, that, that connect to the Adam connection there. He had to leave you there if you're going to walk around down here because one of the functions of your body is to carry around your spirit and soul on planet earth. You, wouldn't, you don't get around down here very good if you don't have a body. <laughs> because the body without the spirit is dead. <laughs> and when you're absent from the body, where do you go? You don't, you don't go to Walgreens and Sears. You go to be with the Lord. <laughs> okay? So he leaves you here. If he's going to leave you here to use, he has to leave you here with your redemption not quite finished. I've paid it. I got the ownership bill. Now I need to go pick it up. Because when I pick it up, I'm going to take it out here and use it. That's my inheritance. Yeah. Yeah, you and me both. That's our prospect. So that's where redemption takes us. Now, if you'd come back with me to Romans chapter 8, you, you kind of get a picture of what's going on here. Because there are really a couple of issues in regard to the redemption of the purchased possession. The earnest of our inheritance. The redemption of your purchased possession first talks about the fact that you're going to be resurrected in the likeness and image of the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 8, verse 18. For I reckon that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. Notice there is a thinking process that you as a believer are to maintain. I reckon. Here's how I think about things. It makes no difference what happens in your life. The most important thing, and I, I, mean, I don't mean it, it does make a difference what happens to you, to you, but the issue of dealing with life is the attitude that you have toward what happens. If a wonderful blessing in life comes and your attitude toward it is sour, you know it won't be a wonderful blessing to you. If a heartache and a tragedy come in life and your attitude toward it has to do with glorifying God, it can be turned in to a wonderful experience that you rejoice in. Paul said, I reckon that the sufferings of this prayer, I'm going to take, I'm going to decide the attitude. I'm going to have a faith attitude. I'm going to walk on the basis of what I know God's doing. I reckon that the sufferings of this present time, I, this is how I've decided to look at it, are not worthy to be compared with the glory. There's something out there coming that makes this look insignificant. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. You know what creation is waiting on out there? They're, like, they're waiting on you to have the best day you're ever going to have. One day, you're going to be manifested, set forth on public display as the sons of God. Your, adoption's gonna, your adoption day is going to be there. And when that happens, all of creation is waiting on that. You know what they're doing? They're waiting on you to come pick them up. <laughs> For the creature, and here's why that is, was made subject to vanity, verse 20, not willingly, but by reason of him who subjected the same in hope. For because the creature itself also shall be delivered from bond, the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. You remember when, when Adam and Eve sinned? And God took Adam and Eve and put them out of the garden? He told Adam, I'm going to curse the ground. Why? Ground didn't do anything. For your sake. And God imposed a curse, the curse of sin, upon an innocent creation for man's sake. And that creation that God made good, said it was good, went into groaning, verse 22 says. The whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. But one day it's going to be delivered into this glorious liberty. You see, God's got a redemption plan for his creation. But it revolves around something he's doing with us. For we know, verse 22, that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. We ourselves groan within ourselves. You know, if all the preaching you hear about prosperity and health and wealth stuff is true, the Apostle Paul must have been a very bad, sad case. And the saints that he writes to must have been a very, very sad situation. 
Not only the world out there, but we which have the first fruits of the Spirit. Those of us that have been sealed with the Spirit, we groan within ourselves. Why? Because we're a part. He's left us here to be a part of this creation. Why would he leave you here for that? Well, think about the moment. If the moment you got saved, he took you to heaven, that'd be okay. But what use would you have been after you got saved? If he made you his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, under good works, which he before ordained that you walk in, if there's some things he has for the saints to do today, he's got to leave you here to do it. So why did he not just save you and take you to glory immediately? Because he had an ambassadorship for you to exercise in time. He's going to come get you. You're on the waiting, you're on the dock waiting on him. He's coming around the parking lot to get you. But while you're waiting, you see, that's, that's, that's the picture. And you notice end of verse 23. What are you waiting for? The adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. You know what you're waiting on? You're waiting on the resurrection. Now, that's going to be some wonderful day. And that's a great prospect. Because we look for we, we you know we, we look to our to heaven, we look for our Savior, who's going to come back, and change our vile body, made it like in His glorious body, take us out of this veil of corruption, and put us into the liberty, of the children of God. He's going to bring it all into our experience in reality without any any veil of flesh, any veil of hesitation. If you go to First Corinthians chapter number fifteen. Sometime you ought to turn the boob tube off, set down the, the Wii, put your cell phone on the charger and go in the other room and spend five or six hours reading 1 Corinthians 15. You want to get your chin off your chest? Here's a chapter that will do it for you. Verse number 41, he says, there is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars. For one star differs from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It, your body, is sown in corruption. You know that. But you see what he says? It is raised in incorruption. You're going to, be, you're going to get a resurrection body that never decays. You know where the healing program for your body is? Right there. Don't ever think God doesn't have a healing program for the body of Christ. He does. It's called the resurrection. That old body of corruption that you live in, Pastor O'Hare used to say years ago, he says, all of the claims of the healers notwithstanding, the death rate is still one apiece. Death is the ultimate disease. And it comes to every man until you come to here. And he says, you know, it's sown in corruption, but it's raised in incorruption. It's sown in dishonor, but it's raised in glory. Talmud said, death is the dishonorable discharge of the old man. Get rid of that old dude. It's going to be raised in glory. We're going to, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall we appear in glory with him. You think you're looking for glory now. You get a moment of glory now, and it's fleeting. The Olympics, we just went through the Olympics, and all these wonderful, glorious moments, and standing on the podium, and getting the gold, and the silver, and the bronze, and winning those things. And where is it now? It's over. We had a yard sale right after we moved, and my wife's got all this stuff sitting on the table there. And she's got this mug. Been sitting in the garage for 15, 20 years. So she put this mug out, put $2 on it, thinking, you know, she'd let them beat her down to 50 cents and she'd sell it. David's walking by, looked at it. He said, Mom, I think maybe you need to rethink this one. She said, why? He said, look, here on eBay, that mug's selling for $85. You know what it was? It was a 1985 Chicago Bear Super Bowl mug <laughs> with all the names of the guys and the pictures and the shuffle and all that stuff. And I told her, I looked at him and said, hey, it was 1985. Get over it. 
You understand? That's, well, that's two, three years ago. What's happened since then? It's what are you doing for me lately is the issue, you know? And that's the thing. When you're raised, it's raised in glory. It's sown in weakness. It's raised in power. Shakespeare said, all, all sleep, uh, sleep, sleep, that gathers up the raveling sleeve of time. Third of your day, you have to declare your weakness and sleep. Man in his best state is weak, vanity. You're going to be raised in power. You're going to be raised with a body that can do some fantastic things. Did you ever look at the resurrection body of the Lord Jesus Christ? He walks up to a room that got the doors locked, and nailed, the, the windows nailed down. You know what he did? No problem. He just walked through the wall. I say, whoa, wait, what, what was that? Show me that again. How you do that? He's here on the earth. He tells some women, he said, you can't touch me. I hadn't ascended to my father or your father, my God and your God. Don't touch me. About two and a half hours later, he, a woman grabs him and holds on to him. What's the difference? Well, why couldn't they touch him? He hadn't ascended to the father. Why could she? Must have done it. Can you imagine in less than three hours leaving earth, going all the way outside the other side of the universe and coming back? In less time it takes me to get to Ridge Farm and back, Ridge Farm. You know what that is? That's moving, buddy. <laughs> you guys that like speed, you're going to have a, you're going to have a, you, what I'm worried about is how to learn how to drive that thing. You know, you get, you get that new body and it can do all these wonderful things and, and you know, but, but you have to figure out how to control that. You walk, you know, you see the little babies that are learning to walk. I'm figuring, whoo, the joystick of that. But, I mean, you know, you laugh about it, and it's kind of fun to talk about it. But, see, that's part of what the hope is. It's the, whole, it's the rejoicing that it gives you about the prospect that's out there for you. It's sown a natural body, a body that can function here on this plane. It's raised a spiritual body, one that can function in the spirit world, in a different dimension than what you live in now. You'll be able to do what Christ did when he stepped from one dimension into the other and then back again. You'll have the capacity to function exactly where God puts you, the way God intends you to, to function. And that spiritual body, if you look at verse 47, the first man is of the earth earthy, the second man is the Lord from heaven, as is the earth, as such are they also that are earthy, and as is the heaven, as such are they also that are heavenly. You know what you're going to have? You're going to have a body fashioned like unto his glorious heavenly body, so that you can function in the inheritance that he gives you. Now come over with me to 2 Timothy chapter 2. That resurrection, well, make it 1 Thessalonians 4. That resurrection takes place at the event we call the rapture. And it puts you in a new glorified body. But listen, it, that takes place in the moment, the twinkling of an eye. Boom, I'm there. What am I going to do after that? 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. To do what? Meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. You say, what does that mean? What's that talking about? Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2. How are you going to ever be with the Lord? People say, well, that means you're going to be on the earth with him. How are you going to get all the saints of the ages on the earth at one time? And if you're on the earth, how with him are you? I mean, we're all here in this room together. We're with one another. But there's a bunch of people in the rest of this building. There are 40, 50 people on the other side of this building over there. Are they with us? Well, if, you're, if the folks down in Ridge Farm, they'd say, well, the, the saints are up there at Shorewood with Brother, with Brother Rick. They'd be right, wouldn't they? Because they're not in Ridge Farm. But we look at it and say, they're not in the room here, so are they with us? Well, no, not really. But yeah, really. So that, that, that idea about being with somebody has to have a context. When he says, with the Lord, you ever hear anybody say, are you with me? 
that is, are you in agreement with me? Are you working with me? Are you with? He says, if you're not with me, you're against me. Remember those verses? That's where that word, you're going to ever be with the Lord. You're never going to be contrary to what God, he's not talking about standing in the physical proximity of the Lord because that would be an impossibility for all the saints to be right next to him all the time. I mean, there's too many of you. But you can be with him in the sense of, are you with me or are you against me? Are you working with me? And what that's talking about is 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12. If we suffer with him, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. Look at here. There is a reigning in an inheritance out there in the ages to come that you and I are going to have the, the privilege to participate in. We literally are going to participate in the government of the heavenly places with the Lord Jesus Christ. We sit together with him. Ephesians 2, when he says we're seated together in heavenly places in Christ, that's not talking about you are here and up there at the same time right now. That's talking about you sit with him and you share his authority in the government of the heavens. And after you get your glorified body, we're going to go into the heavens there and we're going to reign in that heavenly government with him. Just like he has the nation Israel to bring the earth back under the authority of Jesus Christ, the instrumentality of a kingdom vested in the nation Israel, he has a plan to bring the heavenly places back under his authority through the church, the body of Christ. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you need to get some studying done about that because that will change your whole perspective. There's, a, there's some studies in there called eternal glory. Go get them. Spend the next eight, ten hours Learning to rejoice in why God said, He didn't save you just to keep you out of hell. That's a good thing. But He saved you because He's got something for the church, the body of Christ to do in the ages to come. And you know what? We're going to be a part of it. And you're sealed to that. On the way, you're going to get a new body that makes you able to do it. But the new body isn't just to get you out of your grunts and groans now. Otis Watson used to say there'd be no more baldness, no more bifocals, no more uh, bridge work, no more bulges. That'll be good. <laughs> no more bunions. And that's all true. But there's something far more than that. Because it's not what you're not going to have, it's what you are going to have. And you're going to have the privilege and you're going to be fully equipped to participate with him in his heavenly government as the Father's plan to exalt His Son at the, at the head of all things in His creation is accomplished. That's the eternal perspective. That's the Holy Spirit of promise. The Holy Spirit that seals you is the one that guarantees your participation in all of that. That's the prospect of redemption. Now, if you go back to Ephesians 1, verse 13, verse 14, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of His glory. God the Holy Spirit sealing you until the day of redemption, of the purchased possession. You're already bought. You're just waiting to be picked up. And one day He's going to come get you, put you on the truck, take you home, and use you for eternity. I like that. <laughs> what a prospect. Harry Ironside years ago wrote a poem. I use it at every funeral that I do. But I say it to myself more than at funerals. What a prospect, child of glory, doth the future hold in store. By the wildest flights of fancy thou couldst never ask for more. Heir of God, joined heir forever with his own beloved son. God to you could not have promised more of bliss than he's done. Now you notice verse chapter 1, verse 13 to 14, that's God's work. He seals you. He secures you until the day of redemption. But when you go over to chapter number 4, and you notice this other verse, the first passage emphasizes God's part. Chapter 4, verse 30, we like to quote the latter part of that verse whereby he has sealed us under the day of redemption. But notice the first part of that verse emphasizes our part. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. 
whereby you're, re you're sealed unto the day of redemption. You have a relationship with God the Holy Spirit that you are responsible to honor. And that brings us to chapter 5 and the plea of redemption. The claim of redemption on your life. Because he mentions it again, chapter 5, verse, start in verse 15, or start in verse 14. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give you life. They're not talking about physical resurrection or physical sleep. You understand he's talking about going to sleep at the switch spiritually. Wake up. Think about who you are. Become conscious of, of who you are and what's going on around you. And arise from the dead. That's functional death, inactivity in your Christian life. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. As you progress through life, walk like a smart man, not a fool. And the way he says walk is circumspectly. I love that, that description. Walk circumspectly. Circum, you're looking around all the time, what's going on. An old southern preacher, he said that, what that means is you walk like a barefooted man walking through a field full of rattlesnakes. You think if you were barefooted, walk, you think my, I mentioned my wife in the, in, in, in the patch a while ago, you know, she wouldn't walk in that, in, that, in that blackberry patch without those boots. You know why? She'd seen those snakes. And she was, I mean, she's dumb enough to marry me, but she's wise enough not to walk through those things without those, those boots. And you walk in wisdom. You walk circum. You're careful. I'm going to give some attention to my life. I'm not just going to float down the stream of life. I'm going to walk carefully, watching where I put my feet, redeeming the time. You see that word, be, be, but as wise, comma, how do you walk wisely? Redeeming the time because the days are evil. When he says you redeem the time, rescue the time from being lost. Because the days around you will fritter away your time with evil things if you aren't consciously living on purpose. Have you ever noticed how the world will think for you if you let it? Have you ever noticed how others will take advantage of your possessions if you let them? The world will tell you how to spend your money, how to spend your time, how to think about your family. I'm amazed as I watch children. We have children, grandchildren. Our, our kids are gone, but grown, but we have our grandchildren. And I'm amazed at the difference between what the little children watch on television now and what they did when my kids were young compared to what I watched. Can you imagine, can you guys that are older as I am, you remember the Mickey Mouse Club? M-I-C-K-E-Y-M-O-U-S-A, Mickey Mouse, Donald Duck, Mickey. You remember all that? You ought to look at the Mickey Mouse Club on the TV now on the Disney Channel. And you know one of, the, one of the worst things that happens on that is they teach the kids to be disrespectful to their parents. Your dad's a boob, your mama doesn't know what she's doing, and you're the only smart one in the room. And you let your kids watch that, you know what they're going to think because they're learning. And you wonder why. Things get like they get. And they get that stimulation from that stuff. And then they get a little bigger, and they start watching Hannah Montana and that crowd, the sweet life, the, you know, and all that. And I know, I know she's all gone, grown up now and that stuff, but I'm still talking about when, I, when my girls were there. I remember watching the Wiggles. Four screwball little guy. And, I, well, and you know, a four, set of four-year-old twins, girls, just like that. And I'm thinking, how do you do that? And you know what they do? They set their tone. They set their... But don't, don't get so bent out about the kids. You watch the Super Bowl commercials? That's candy for adults. And what are they trying to do? They're trying to tell you how to think, what you need, how you ought to spend your money, what you ought to think is good, is good parenting, Good living, bad parenting, bad living. You can't live like that. You can't drive that. You can't do these things. You've got to do it. Advertising is built on telling you a truth and then telling you a lie 
and getting you to believe a falsehood about the lie in order to sell you a product. Every ad you see, study media, I study it. They'll tell you something that's true, then they'll tell you something that's not true. And then they'll tell you, I got a solution. It's an illusion. But that medium becomes the message. He says, you know what you need to look? The world out there is evil. And has evil intents towards you. And as you suck it up, you need to reach out there and rescue your time. Redeem it. Time's the most precious possession you have. Can I tell you something about time? Time proves character. Time looks at you, and it looks for your purpose. What are you really about? And it proves you. That's why time will promote you, or it'll expose you. Oftentimes, people get a little impatient with me, because I've learned to be patient about things. Something will be going on, and people say, oh, what, what's going on? What's go I say, I don't know yet. When are you going to know? Time will tell. And you go through all those verses that talk about how to discern things. And all those verses that tell you to be patient and not, 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 not jump to conclusions. Why? Because time will demonstrate character. It will eventually reveal what's going on. You know what you know better do? You better take that time and redeem it. You have to understand time is, a, is an important thing. I read a thing one time. It so impressed me. I wrote it down. If you improve one-third percent a day, you'll be 1,600% better in five years. And I thought, wow, I'd like to be 1,600% better in five years. Just improve one-third of a percent, 1.3%, 1 not even 3%, but just 0.3. You know what? Time has that cumulative value. It'll go the other way, too. You follow that? You know what redemption says? You know who you are in Jesus Christ says? It says you need to take every moment you have and use them for God's glory. You need to take every moment you have and every experience that comes into your life and live wisely. Look around and see what the reality is. Know what really is going on. Don't just look at the surface things. Don't look at the, the, the outward things. Look by faith at the things that aren't seen, the eternal things, and focus there, understanding that those things are what really make life in the long run. If you're a mom or a dad, we have a lot of young couples with young children. Can I tell you, you only have right now to raise your kids. When that kid gets to be 15, 17, 18 years old, it's too late to start raising them. Your opportunity is now. And if you don't do it now, you're going to lose the opportunity. Because time proves character. And time promotes you or it exposes you. But it looks for your purpose. It looks for what are you really about. If you're single, we have a number of single people. I, I tease people all over the country. I'm traveling. I tell them, if you'll move to Chicago, come to Shorewood, we'll get you a job and a spouse. <laughs> and we've got enough single people here, we could, we could marry off a whole bunch of people. But you know what? If you're single, 1 Corinthians 7 says for the, that when a guy gets married, a woman gets married, they have to care for their spouse. When you're single, you've got time to do things you're never going to have time to do in, in your life otherwise. You've got opportunity to do things otherwise in your life you won't have to do when you get the obligations of a spouse and a family. You know what you need to do? Use it. Use it wisely. Take advantage of the opportunities that it puts into your life that won't be there forever. You never have a time in your life that you can go out and be a soul winner and do evangelism like you do right now. You never have a time in your life when you can study and learn and grow like you do right now. Use it. You say, but I'm lonely. Listen, one of the, great, the two great things about loneliness is God has provided you, one, with his comfort and presence, and two, with a fellowship of assembling saints together to help with that. 
And you don't have to be lonely. You don't have to sit around and be bored. Listen, there's things to do, but you have to live on purposely. Purpose, walk circumspectly. Be wise. And sit down and you redeem the time. Don't just let it float along. But buy it back. Rescue it from loss. Married folks, especially young married couples, before you have your family, you need to learn in your marriage to, to build the foundations for family life to come. You need to build into your relationship the foundation of godliness in the husband and the wife. You need to learn what it is to work together and to use your home as a natural environment for ministry. Don't let it be strange. I talked to a couple just recently. And they'd gotten saved before they got married. They got married and they got involved in, you know, they had a job transfer. Moved to another state. They didn't get involved in a local church. This, the lady had some terrible things that happened to her as a young, young single, young mother in her home. She'd been molested by her daddy. Some terrible scars that she carried in her, in her soul and kept them internally. She was in her 60s before she ever let any of that stuff out. And you go through the history of her life and this tragedy and heartache. She's a performer. She was doing, but internally she was in total turmoil. Didn't think God loved her. Didn't think others loved her. The natural result of that kind of thing, when it isn't handled... By the way, in Ephesians 1, when it talks about even the forgiveness of sins, we're going to have a couple of stu studies in the next couple of weeks on forgiveness that are absolutely vital. And this dear lady, life just completely wrenched out. And then in her 60s, she heard about being accepted in the beloved. <laughs> and she told me, she said, you know, I've lived my whole life striving to be accepted, never feeling worthy. Oh, what a joy to hear I was. And she said, now I look back over 40 years, 35 years of heartache, if I'd have just known it back then. Time. Time. You follow that? Build into your life, into your marriage now, the foundation that will give your family the opportunity to have something. Pass on, and let your home be a place for ministry. Don't fritter away time. You get older. You get into your eldership. <laughs> I'll be there too, not before too long. And you get... You get you know one of the great things in Scripture about elders, eldership, is a capacity, we call it being a benefactor. Able to give to others without expecting anything in return. Able to share wisdom. Able to share the resources gained over a life. Don't go sit in a closet and be bitter. Be useful. Redeeming the, the Redemption pleads with you. Come on, let's get on. Time is the most precious possession you have. Use it. Don't lose it. For unsaved people, he says, Behold, now is the day of salvation. If you notice a few moments ago, Brother Lou and his wife left. They're going to a funeral. Start, started about three minutes ago. Brother Jan Moscovich, some of you will remember Jan. He was the head of Jews for Jesus here in Chicago. I met him back in the late 80s, early 90s. Wonderful brother. We became friends because he understood a commitment to the clarity of the gospel that we shared. We used to argue about things, contend about dispensational things because we weren't the same there. He really didn't care for the King James Bible thing. He used it, but just, you know, you got, you know. And the right division stuff, he had a little, but he had a grip on the gospel, the clarity of the gospel. 
He got transferred from here to New York City to be the head of their organization. Last Wednesday, he was out on the street corner, 62 years old, out on the street corner passing out tracks. Someone stuck a knife in him and pushed him down the stairs in the Manhattan subway, and he died. Now, when Jan left home last Wednesday morning, kissed his wife by and went to his office and then went out on the street to do, do his, his, his gospeling, sharing the gospel, he didn't know that would be a day he wouldn't go home. His wife was expecting him home for supper that evening, and the saints were expecting him in the fellowship that evening, and he didn't get there. Because his life was taken away just that quickly. You know, that's the way life is. You don't have any promise of tomorrow, no matter who you are, no matter what you're doing. Redeeming the times. Now is the day of salvation. If you've never trusted Christ, today is the day to do that. You don't want to have eternity unsettled in your life. If you're young, imagine facing the rest of your life not knowing where eternity was going to lead you, leave you. And if you're old, er, imagine sitting on the front porch waiting to go into the presence of the Lord uncertain. No. You need to have it settled today. Because you, you can't boast of tomorrow. You don't know what it holds. But if you're saved, you have the same proposition. Today is the day of your opportunity. Don't receive the grace of God in vain. What's, what, what redemption says, the problem with redemption is you're a sinner. You're separated from God. So somebody has to come pay the price for you. So the price of redemption is the price of God's own son. God paid the price for you, made it fully and completely available so he could give it to you as a free gift. The prospect of redemption is he's going to take you one day and use you as a trophy for that grace in the ages to come. And the plea that that puts on your heart is for you not to fritter, fritter away the life that God gives you in his son. Father, we thank you today for the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. We thank you for the privilege of it. And we pray that our hearts might be constrained by your love for us. And we rejoice in that in Christ Jesus' name. Amen.